Good morning. The scripture for today is Psalm 51, verses 7 through 12. If you're following along in the uh, Pew Bible, that's page 889. I'm reading from the NIV version. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot, blot out all of my inequity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Please give your attention to Peter. God is amazing the way he has created us, our bodies and our soul, our mind, how everything works and how they all kind of work together. And he's given us at least five senses, senses that we are aware of. We're able to see, we're able to hear, we're able to taste, to smell, and to touch. And I wonder what life would be like if we didn't have those senses. It would be a lot different, wouldn't it? And so we understand that when something goes wrong, our senses are able to help us. So in other words, when someone is playing a sport and dislocates a knee, what happens? It hurts, okay? That's the first thing that happens because that's a sense. It's a sense of feeling to say there's a problem. And we need to fix the problem right away. And if you didn't have the sense, then you'd continue going on and you'd probably destroy everything. So our bodies are made with the ability to tell us when something is wrong. So we understand that physically. But what about emotionally? What about spiritually? Is there something that that happens to us that maybe is telling us something is wrong. Something is not working right. So if you have uh, a dislocated joint, you've got a problem with that area in your body. If you have a pinched nerve, it tells you you've got pain there. But if we have emotional pain, that's just the pain part. What's the source? What is wrong? And that's what I want to talk about today because through the Psalms, and we were talking about this last week, but today we want to look at David because he had a lot of these senses in his body that were telling him that there was something wrong and it wasn't physical, it was emotional and spiritual. And yet some of these same things that he was experiencing... People also experience today, regardless of what their source of depression is, or anxiety, or discouragement, or hopelessness. These things kind of work together. And so we want to talk today about this idea of, of David and his life and the decisions he made. Mistakes and sins that he made. And God has included all those in the Bible for us to read, and I'm thinking there's something we can learn from it. It's, you know, the Old Testament is not just a history lesson. It's not just for information only. It's to show us how to live. How people that have gone on before. Uh, the victories and joys they experience, but also the defeats and disappointments. And these things can help us. So David was the king of Israel, and he found himself in a royal mess. And so we want to talk about what he was going through, and see how we can also learn from this lesson. So most of the time today, we're going to be looking in Psalm 38. So if you find your place there, the, the, the Psalm 53 is, is similar. 53 definitely seems to be talking about after David has received forgiveness, but you see in that chapter even that, that was read, uh, he still has some doubts. He's still discouraged. He still has some questions. He's still praying out to God. And, just, and then he's feeling the distance. And so he's, he's praying that, that God would restore him and, and strengthen him and bring him back. 
But Psalm 38 is uh, also a psalm of regret and sorrow and repentance. There are several of these psalms. One is 53, Psalm 6, and also Psalm 38. And there's actually five altogether called penitential psalms, and most of them written by David. But this is how he describes his condition. My iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. So again, this, this picture of, I mean, he is drowning in his pain. He is drowning in his sorrow or he's even drowning in his shame. He's saying, this is too much for me. I, I cannot go on. It's like somebody putting a heavy burden on you and you get to the point after a while of carrying the burden you say, I cannot take another step. I am about to fall down. I am being crushed. I, I cannot go on like this. Something has got to change. And again, there's people that get to this point in their life where they see the burden is so heavy and apparently there's no one around to help them lift it and they get so discouraged and, and, and they don't see any hope. And sometimes people make it through that dark day and difficult time, but others don't make it through it. They end their life. Right? So people don't just decide to become suicidal because everything is going well. Right? It, it's, it's obvious. There's, there's a lot of pain in their life that they don't know what to do with. So we want to talk, uh, again, just maybe reviewing what we talked about last week really quickly, because I think this is very important, because I don't want anyone to hear me saying that all of, you know, people's discouragement, anxiety, sorrow, fear, you know, all those things, they don't all come from the same place. It's not all the same source. So we showed this list last week. So not at all are we saying that the source is the same. Today we do want to talk about this source, the last one on the list, of Guilt, shame, and sin, because that's what Psalm 38 is about. But you may be feeling some of the same symptoms in your life when you are discouraged and depressed. And I think maybe even at the end, the answer is very similar. But this is what David is going through. So again, does everybody understand what I'm saying right now? Not everyone who is depressed, it does not all come from this source of guilt, shame, and sin. It could be any of the other things. Does that make sense? I, I just don't want anybody to go away saying, well, our preacher today said that, you know, if you have any kind of uh, discouragement, then you're a sinner and you just need to repent and then everything will get better. There's, there's other reasons that people have uh, these kinds of difficulties and challenges and, and struggles in their life, okay? So as long as we're clear on that, I, I can go forward. So what was he feeling? What was going on? So back in Psalm 38... Here's some things that he was experiencing. First of all, he's saying, God has pierced me with his arrows. Now, you know that God is not out doing target practice. He doesn't have his crossbow out, you know, getting ready for deer season. It's not that. We know he's, he's making uh, an analogy here. How does he feel? I don't know. Has anybody here ever been shot by an arrow? It's got to hurt. Would you, could you imagine? I mean, first of all, going in, it hurts coming out maybe hurts even more so he is struggling he is hurting you don't just say oh David you know you're going to be okay everything's fine you know it's all in your head it's like I am suffering to this degree that I feel like I've been shot by now what does it say it's not one arrow right so here this is the way he's feeling okay so somehow you can't discredit oh David you're not feeling that say no this is how I feel this is what I'm going through. Well, what else does it say about him? It says, God's heavy hand is on me. So it's kind of like God, and you know, God did not do this literally. He wasn't reaching out from heaven and putting his hand on David. And, and it's kind of like a parent with a child. You know, when a child maybe is about to do something, or they're about to take off, or, you know, they're about to, you know, just run away. And so you can, you got, you got a heavy hand. I mean, you're big, your child's like three years old, and so you can stop them physically, you can restrain them, and so they're feeling like, again, I've got this burden. God is just holding me, so I'm not free anymore. God's got his heavy hand on me. He goes on to say, I'm unsound in my flesh. Like my body, it's starting to ache. My muscles, 
I don't feel very well. I feel like maybe I'm getting a severe case of the flu. Maybe I've got some kind of disease. I don't think he had a disease. Well, except the sin disease. He was just feeling all this in himself because of his guilt and shame. He knew he had sin, but it was the guilt and shame that was controlling him. And, and it was actually coming out in a physical manner as far as the way he felt in his body. Okay? So it was kind of an emotional, a spiritual, a mental, a heart issue problem, but it was coming out in the way he was living unhealthy in my bones, which says what? I mean, if it's just your flesh, I mean, that's your muscles, but this pain is going deeper. It's not just like we call a flesh wound. I mean, his bones, you ever, you know, people say, boy, I'm, I am just cold to my bones. I mean, he may not be that cold, but that's just saying it's getting all the way through me. It's covering every part of my life. I mean, I cannot escape this. It's, Again, overwhelming me, but also in a physical sense. I just feel unhealthy in every part of my body. As a matter of fact, I feel like I have festering wounds. Now, that, that's kind of both sad and gross, isn't it? You know, you get a wound and you hope it's going to heal. But you know when it festers? It doesn't seem to be getting better. It just seems to be it, it, in painful, uh, it's certainly very unsightly. He'll go on in just a minute to say it's starting to smell. That's not, I don't think it was physical. Now, some people say he had a physical disease, but I think he's just saying, this is how I feel emotionally because of what's going on. I feel bowed over. Again, the word is literally, literally prostrate, laying down, right? Just, he, he cannot get up. I am bent over. I, I, I just have a hard time walking, making it through the day. I, I, I get, well, such a loss of energy. I go mourning crying, weeping, all day. We talked about that a little bit last week as uh, some of the other psalmists felt this way, just crying. Uh, again, just, it could be anything. Just, just something comes to his memory or he sees something and it reminds him or maybe somebody says something. Have you ever been in sorrow like that? Sometimes people are in sorrow like that when they go through a very deep loss, maybe through the, lo the loss of a loved one, Right? And you kind of feel like you're going okay until you, you see somebody, maybe it's a good friend or another relative, and they just kind of come over and they, I mean, before they even say anything, I mean, you just start bawling all over again. Well, that, that, that's a natural response. Certainly that's not somebody in depression. That's somebody who's got healthy sorrow for a loss in their life. But he's like this all the time because of the sin that he's committed and the guilt and the shame that he carries with him all day long. And so he would describe it this way in Psalm chapter 6, which we mentioned earlier was another one of these psalms that he wrote about his sin and how he felt through it. I am weary with moaning. I mean, I've been crying and despondent and sad so long. I'm getting tired of being sad and crying and weeping. Somehow, I've got to get through this, but... I'm just tired of feeling like this all the time. Every night I flood my bed with tears. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Every night. It's not some nights. Every night. Every night I cry a little bit. I get a little tissue and I just kind of take the little, it's just a little bit of moisture coming up in my eye. Is that what flooding your bed with tears means? I don't think so. I think it's like he cries and then cries and doesn't stop crying. And again, we get the, the feeling and the sense of what he's going through. It's not, you know, again, sometimes when people are really, really sorrowful, they'll cry, like even at a funeral, right? Most people, and there's not a right or wrong way to do a funeral, you know, when it's your loved one that died, but, you know, you'd cry, and then, you know, you'd kind of compose yourself, and then, you, you know, maybe cry again, you know, so it's kind of on again, off again. This sounds like he doesn't stop. He just keeps crying and crying and crying. So, again, that, that makes it very uncomfortable for people around him, doesn't it? You ever been around someone like that where, like, they've been crying? Well, how long have they been crying for? Well, well, it's been like three hours. and They've not stopped. It's just as strong and, and sensitive and heartfelt now as it was when they first started. This is a heavy burden that he is carrying. I drench my couch with my weeping. So that's what he's doing during the daytime. Just crying day and night. He's 
has such a hard time getting over it. My eye wastes away because of my grief, and it grows weak because of all my foes. So just this deep sorrow he's experienced. So going back to the list in Psalm 38, in case you thought we were done, we're not. My sides are burning, and my body is weak. Right? So again, physically, I, I'm just having a hard time making it through this. I feel feeble and crushed. I have a groaning heart. So again, it's not just an outward emotion, but inside he feels this grieving and this groaning. And like groaning is kind of saying, I don't even know how to explain it or to express it or to share it. Somebody says, well, how are you doing? And I mean, all you can get out is, yeah. Right? Like, what do you say? How do you share this grief? It's so deep. Just groanings. My heart throbs. So again, there's another condition, right? Sometimes people go to the doctor and, and, and the doctor may, they just may say, I'm not feeling very well. And they say, you know, you've got a problem with your heart, right? Maybe it's out of rhythm or maybe it's racing and, you know, it needs to slow down or, you know, maybe there's a, a physical manifestation of what's going on because of, of things that are happening in your life and they may do all kinds of tests and they may say, Again, there's a lot of reasons why that could happen, but they may say it's just because you have a lot of anxiety in your life. That even your heart is not working the way it should. My strength fails. There's no light in my eyes. So he is in a very, very deep place. If you're following along in the chapter, you know we're not done. So we have another slide. I'm just saying all these things are, are, are listed, like just one after another, because I think the psalmist and God doesn't want you to think, oh yeah, David just kind of had a little bit of a hard time with this thing. I mean, how can you explain it any deeper than what he's saying here? Friends and family are distant. The people that I hoped I could count on, the people that I could share, maybe they would help me lift my burden. Maybe they could somehow encourage, maybe they could pray with me. Maybe they could just come and read the Bible. I don't know. I, I want somebody to help me, but even the people closest to me, my own family members, you know, my wife or my kids, my friends, the people that I'm close to. David could say, and maybe you felt that way, the people that I've even helped when they've been through difficult times, they're not here. They don't want to come by. And to a certain degree, I mean, you think they should, but you can hardly blame them. Because if what David has already expressed, they're like, that's just too much for me to bear. I mean, how can I help this person that's crying all the time? Their wound is wide open. I mean, it's so bad, it stinks. Again, it's not literal, but it's figurative. The pain and suffering, it's just so hard to be around David when he's going through all of this and feeling all these things. People are after me. Now, whether they were or not, that's up for discussion, I guess, but perhaps it's a little bit of paranoia. Again, when people are depressed, sometimes I think, and this is real, when people are depressed, really depressed, you know what they think? Nobody loves me. Do you think anybody loves them? There's people that love them. No, nobody cares. Look, it's already 10 o'clock in the morning and no one's called me. I, I think if I die today, no one would miss me. I think this world would be a better place if I wasn't here. So all these things, now are those things true? No, they're not true. But you, you, may, you may think those things. So that's the, that's the struggle when people are in a very deep depression that they, their imagination and their mind goes a little bit extreme and thinks things that are not true. I am, I am unable to listen. And maybe that's just, you know, whenever someone does come by and tries to console and to help and strengthen and build up, it's just, you know, their words don't mean anything. You, you hardly comprehend. And maybe even when they leave, you've forgotten everything they said. So even if people do talk to you, you don't really hear, you don't comprehend what they're saying, and maybe you don't believe, you know, if somebody came and said, you know, but I know God really loves you. I mean, Jesus died for you. I mean, you are so important. You're valuable. I mean, you've got your, your, your friends. You've got your children. You know, you've all kinds of things that, that are truth that people may share with you, but you just have a hard time comprehending. As a matter of fact, you also have a hard time communicating. 
right? We talked about this a little last week. Somebody says, well, like, what do you think is wrong? I mean, sometimes people even go to therapists and, and to counselors and to psychologists. And they say, I don't know, I've got, I've got all these symptoms and I don't really know why. And so even a, a counselor will try to help you at least get to the understanding of what it is. But sometimes it's like, even the counselor's like, I don't know what, we've talked a lot, we've asked a lot of questions, we've tried to unearth and uncover and determine maybe what the source is. And it's just hard to know what it is. So even when people talk to me, I mean, what do I say? How do I respond? Now I know how we respond in church, right? Because we're good church folk. Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Liar? No, yeah, I, I don't know. It's like, I mean, sometimes we are doing great, and that's wonderful. Praise God. But it's anybody. Okay, put up your hand if you want. Is anybody here doing great every week when you come to church? Anybody? Apparently just me. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I mean, we're not. Okay? And maybe passing somebody in the hallway is maybe not the best time to unload. But maybe it is to get together with a friend right here in this room sometime and say, hey, can we get together for a coffee? Can you come by the house? Can we talk on the phone? You want to know something? I don't even feel like talking. Can I send you an email or a text or something? Would, would that be okay? Right? So it'd be nice to have a friend, at least that we can unload something. Even if it's like, I don't know why, but I can tell you how I'm feeling. Right? So maybe it's important. I mean, you look in the New Testament, Old Testament as well, but New Testament is very big on, hang on, there's a theme that I was thinking about. Oh yeah, encourage one another. Right? So if you didn't get that, that's the theme for the year, right? This is what we're trying to work on. Building up each other, encouraging one another. Well, this is one of the times we would do that when people are really down. I'm about to fall. That kind of encompasses all the things we talked about. And I'm in constant pain. So it's both physical, it's emotionally, it's in the heart, it's in the mind, it's in the body. It's consuming his life. Well, what do we do? I mean, where do we go from here? Uh, is there any hope at all? Well, there's a few verses even in Psalm 38 that may help. Kind of in the middle, as, he, as he's explaining how he feels. And I think this is mostly just a prayer to God that, that we are allowed to listen to, that we are a part of, because it's written in Scripture. So he's not really explaining this to any, anybody else but to the Lord. So here's his prayer. O oh Lord, all my longing is before you. Everything I feel, everything I've been going through, you are aware of it. You know about it. You know, in the New Testament, Romans chapter 8, it says there's times, and I don't, I don't think it's always, it's not all the time, but there's times when we pray to God and we don't know what to say. Sometimes we pray to God, we may even have words, and the Holy Spirit takes our words and he brings them to God. And so some people, I know none of you would think that, but somehow they think the Holy Spirit is like, okay, I heard that, now, oh yeah, you guys are in Royal Michigan, it's English, okay, I got it in English. I'm going to have to take it to God to tell him in Hebrew, you know, because God doesn't know English. That's not what he's doing. Well, what's he, what's he bringing up to God? I kind of see it like the Holy Spirit goes up and says, you know when Peter was praying today, and not that God doesn't know anyway, but it's kind of just to help us to understand how God really does work, because the Holy Spirit is a part of God too, but the Holy Spirit takes our prayer. This is what Peter said. You know, he said he's just feeling down, and he thinks it's because he's had a hard day at work, or because he kind of got caught in traffic, or because they're doing, you know, something at the house. That's what Peter said. But I know what Peter really wants. I know what's in his heart. And he didn't really express this, but this is what Peter needs. So God knows it all, right? He just doesn't know what we say, because sometimes we don't know how to express it, or even when we think we're really smart, and we've done a great job of expressing it. In, in, in reality, it, it's not really what's needed. It's not really getting to the core. It's not looking into the heart. It's, again, just looking at the externals. Oh dear God, I just have a bad headache today. Take my headache away. 
And God's saying, well, what about dealing with the inner issues? Maybe, and again, don't hear me say that every time somebody has a headache because there's something else going on. Usually when you have a headache, there is something going on. It could just be high blood pressure or stress, or, but it also could be, you know, anxiety. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons, but God knows what the source is. And, and, and so he knows. My sighing, so just the whole grieving and pain and suffering and moaning, and it's, it's not hidden from God. He knows. See, the thing is, we can hide it from everybody else. We just do this in our home in our bedroom, or we may even say in a biblical sense, in our closet. Well, if we're sighing in our closet, what else should we be doing in our closet? The old, old time translation says, you know, we should be praying in our closet, right? It says, don't go out and do your prayers for everybody. Go into your, well, that's a good place when you're alone with God, to be honest with him, to, to know he, he sees, he understands, and he's going to help us through this. God is very connected but for you, O oh Lord, I do wait. Again, sometimes it's easy to just say, I'm going to wait for a better day. I'm going to wait for a weekend like we just had, you know, where it's sunny, it's warm, I can get out, we can do stuff. I'm going to wait for something else. That's not what he said. No, here's a better idea. I'm going to wait for a, a person. There's going to be somebody that's going to come into my life and, and they're going to save me. They're going to help me. They're going to understand. They're going to be able to lift me up. No, he's not saying I'm looking for someone else. He's saying, God, I'm looking for you. I desire you. You're the one who can strengthen me and help me through this. It's to you I wait. Boy, but isn't that hard, the waiting? The waiting when you're going through suffering? I mean, again, have you ever been in a lot of pain uh, medically? Right? So again, broken bone or joint out of place or pinched nerve in your back and you finally get to the doctor and you know what the receptionist says? Well, the doctor's a little behind. You're going to have to wait. I'm tired of waiting. I don't want to wait. I waited three weeks to get the appointment. Where's Bill Morley? You know, I mean, because that's, I mean, that was his struggle with his knee, right? I mean, it's been so long just to getting to see the doctors. Got to wait a little. Who wants to wait that much time in pain? But sometimes you have to wait. So he's just saying, I'm just going to wait. Somehow I'm going to see there's future ahead. Uh, there's better days. There's hope. There's something that God is going to do. It is you, O oh Lord, my God, who will answer. You're, you're the one who I need. So I'm just going to wait for you to work in me and through me. And, and, and you are going to make things right. And that's certainly the exciting thing about the gospel that we have. Again, verse 21, do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, do not be far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. So again, he's, he's realizing I need to be saved. Right? I, I just don't need someone to give me a hand or a little assistance. I, I, need, I need a complete makeover. I need a, a complete transformation. God, I need salvation. And so this is his prayer. This is to God whom he calls out to. And so this kind of takes us to the royal mess that we started with. So David suffered because of his sin. He struggled because of his sin. And, and he knew what it was like to go through these low and lonely, and discouraging and disappointing days. And so we see the mess that he was in. And maybe we have felt that way emotionally. And I guess this is, this is the difference that, that maybe it makes from someone that, that, that's a Christian to the person that doesn't know God at all. That somehow his mess can now be changed and transformed into something he can help others with. That he can share, you know, I... Like, can anybody here say, after I've read this and understood this, David has no idea what I'm feeling. I, I'm in a way worse condition than he is, or was. Uh, I, I don't know how you would describe that, because we've already seen how traumatic he's been through in a situation, in the days and weeks, months, that he went through this. But he's able to write it down, write down a prayer to God, maybe even made into a song, that people even sang, because David loves singing. 
Singing actually lifted his soul. Singing helped him. We're going to see if we can do this next week to do some more singing to lift our soul, to realize the power that comes from music. David understood this because David was a very, very young man, probably 16, 17 years old. He was told he was going to become the king by Samuel. So it was called, he's anointed the king. He, he wasn't in the position of king, but he, he was declared he would be the future king of Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 16. You know what else happened? A very young boy, even before Goliath. Saul, because of his sin, ended up having a lot of stress and distress, and discouragement, and anger in his life. And he knew that God had left him. The Bible says God's spirit left him, which allowed an evil spirit to come. It says actually God sent the evil spirit into Samuel. Do you know how Samuel, when he had an evil spirit came upon him, do you know how he was soothed? You know what helped him through that? A 17-year-old shepherd boy playing his harp and singing some songs about Jehovah. That's what David did. And it soothed Saul's soul. I, maybe, that's, maybe that's how David really understood the biblical spiritual therapy that comes from God. And so this is what David does even in his own life, able to come up with this message. And so, just kind of helping us think about a week tomorrow is our seminar. So we really encourage you to come. I'm sure the speakers are not going to be talking specifically about what I talked about, but it's along the same theme. And so the seminar is for you that if you've ever struggled with this, because the thinking is if you ever struggled with it, you may struggle with it again. Or if you know somebody who has ever struggled or is currently struggling with depression and discouragement and anxiety and just all the things that happen, regardless of the issue or the source, then we want you to come to the seminar. But we also want you to think about inviting other people, inviting your friends. And so it can be so easy because this is so practical and it's so prevalent. It's such a real need in our world. Again, it's not just today. It's been all the time. People have suffered through this struggle. And some people have won, and some people have lost. But I think this is very practical and will be very helpful. Uh, so by the way, Monday evening is when Ryan Fraser will be here. So he, he is a PhD psychologist. Uh, he is a professor at Fried Hardman University in their psychology department. He has his own counseling practice where he meets with people, couples, families, people that are going through things that we're talking about right now. And so he's a counselor. Uh, on Sunday mornings, he preaches at a local congregation. So he's very in tune with both adults and, and young people, teens and college-age kids, a lot of the stuff they're going through on the campus. Uh, and so this is a really big issue that even our young people are going through. So he's going to have a lot of good information and, and for us, and so we're excited to have him. And then Joe Wells will be here Tuesday night. Many of us are familiar with him, who's very practical and himself upbeat. And then uh, Wednesday, Matthew Moraine will be here from Colorado. Uh, and he's also a young guy who's um, upbeat and encouraging and positive, and I think he'll have a lot of good things to share as well. So we're excited about the seminar. We just want to say... You know, be involved with it, pray for it. Uh, if, if you want to sign up to help us, maybe on one of the evenings with childcare or serving in some other way, um, there's something for everybody to do, but we definitely want everyone to be here. Because I know sometimes seminars like this happen, and then you have some people that'll say, oh, I missed it. Was that last week, that seminar? So don't be that person. And if you are that person, just don't tell anybody, especially me. Because I'll, I'll probably help get your senses back by, you know, hitting you on the back of the head saying, come on! But the other thing is, a lot of times people show up at a seminar and they really, really enjoy it. I don't know if you, I do this a lot. I go to a seminar and I think, 
I should have invited that guy. I should have invited that neighbor. I should have called that family member. But they weren't here because I didn't invite them. So don't want anybody to have regrets, right, to say this was fantastic, right? So we've been doing a lot of advertising so we're not sure how many people here. Some people are saying there's going to be a lot more than usually comes. So uh, I got to talk to Ron about overflow because we're using some of the other rooms. But I don't know how many. I, I've, had, I've had one phone call today from somebody in Royal Oak that works with people that are struggling with discouragement. He says, can I bring some people? And I'm like, sure. And he said, well, I'm thinking of like 20 or 30. Like he's, you know, because he works with people that are struggling with this. That's one guy. So... If you bring more than 20 or 30, you win the prize, okay? Uh, Judy was saying we could just offer everybody like a tablet. Who, everybody who comes, tablet. You, it's like, okay, no, that's not, that's not happening. Well, so we really encourage you to share the message, either electronically, email, Facebook. Uh, there's a lot of the invitations uh, in the foyer. Again, some people say, why did you... Why are you giving us so many invitations? It's like, well, we got 4,000 printed up. It's not, this invitation is not just for you. It's for you to take some to your friends and family and invite them and say, come on out to the seminar. It's going to be really good. So there's also the video um, that we have online. So that's both on Facebook and we showed it last week, Facebook and YouTube. So if you're electronic at all, you can share the video and then it's kind of got the inf information. It's kind of, I think it's kind of motivational to try to encourage people to come. Um, so we've had uh, several hundred people look at it. Some people kind of wondered about the song. So we played it last week. It was an a cappella version of a song um, that was done. And so you may say, oh, you've never heard of that song. Why would you use that song? Nobody's heard of it. Um, and so I did look online to see the people that originally did the song. Um, so they have a few more hits than just a few hundred on their, the people that are listening to this song, there was actually about 365 million people that have listened to that song on YouTube. So I'm thinking if half of them show up, we'll be in good shape, <laughs> right? So, okay. So that's the seminar coming up, and we just really want you to be a part of it, because uh, I think it would be a blessing to everybody. Well, this is how we're ending with Peter. I mean, it seems like Peter knows what it is to experience disappointment, and discouragement, maybe even a little bit of depression. By the way, you know, David, think about, he was someone who was, we would say, an emotional person. I mean, when he was high, I mean, he, he was just really excited. He was lively. He was very uh, energetic. He, he was very expressive, right, in his emotions. But when he was discouraged, you know what I mean? When some people, and people are that, some people are very melancholy. It's like they're kind of evil, ke even keel most of the time. But when you're really expressive, emotionally high, boy, when you get down low, that's, that's really low, right? Peter, maybe the same way, kind of very expressive. And, you know, so maybe when he was high, he was high. But here he's saying this to us, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. I don't know, that mighty hand of God, does that sound like what we talked about with David, that God's hand is on him? Or just God's hand is under him, trying to lift him up, but God's hand so that he will exalt you, he will lift you up, he will help you and strengthen you at the right time. But what does it say? Cast all your anxieties. Cast all your anxieties. Throw them all on God. Let him have them. Deliver them. Hand them over to God. God wants us to do that. This is what Peter's saying. Do this. This is what God says. Give God your anxieties and your discouragements, and your disappointments, and your sorrow. Give them to God. Why is that? Because he cares for you. God does care for us. He loves us. I'm thankful for what Phil said today around the Lord's table. He talked about Jesus. He had to make a decision in his life. Jesus was tempted like we are tempted, but he made a decision. He would overcome temptation so he could do God's will. Before Jesus went to the cross... He had to make a decision whether he was going to do what God had planned for him to do or whether he was going to reject it. And so he prayed, Lord, if you could take this cup away from me, if there's any other way, let's do it another way. But not my will, but your will be done. So Jesus decided that he would die for us. But we make our own decisions. We, we've decided, are we going to live for God? Are we going to obey God? 
Are we going to stay in the will of God? Are we going to keep within the plan of God? Or are we going to choose our own way? And I know everyone here well enough to say, you've chosen your own way. You've chosen to depart from God, to resist God, to sin against God, right? So we've all done that. So you do have one more decision today. To say, now I'm going to accept Christ in my life. That's a decision you make. Jesus says, you come to me, you want to come? You're welcome. The door is open. Arms are wide. I'm ready to accept you and to embrace you and to carry you and to love you and to save you. I'm ready to do that. And if you're ready today to be in the arms of Christ, say, I'm going to surrender my life to you. Be baptized into Christ. Let's stand. We'll sing this song. Let us know if we can serve you in this way.